Cheers, guys. Epic's here. Welcome to VR Roundup, episode 30, on a game in Friday. Speaking of which, hopefully you guys are having a fantastic one at that. Let's start things off with the Pimax and just jump right into it. So the Pimax unit, I've gone in-depth about this during one of the podcasts. We're not going to rehash that all here. Suffice it to say, I wasn't worried then. I said, look, the situation for them with the funding, they may announce a delay, but they're going to release We'd rather have them take the time and do it properly. And it looks like that's exactly what they're doing. They have announced uh, as of the other day that they are going to delay shipment to the second quarter. So April, May, June, let's just assume that means the end of June in time for the summer, right at the beginning of the summer to have that Pimax. Next up, had some fun with this one during my podcast yesterday. A little tongue-in-cheek, uh, but didn't really stress after all of that how cool I think this thing actually is for the 15 bucks US. And I would agree with David Jagno from Upload VR that this analog nub, the 3D printed mod, brings some welcome functionality to the Vive. Now, I share his preference for a nub-style device over a trackpad for the majority of scenarios, even though I do have a few where I do think a trackpad would be preferable. However, the beauty of this device, guys, you can tailor the experience by simply clicking it on or taking it off. It's that easy with this thing. You can see that in the video or pictures. I spent, like I said, too much of the podcast uh, with my crappy hack. What I wanted to stress, and I will stress here now, is that for $15, you get a much more elegant solution and really only requires a small strip of conductive filament if you want to complete the functionality. In other words, you can use it simply as a button that way, move it over and get your button click functionality. But if you want the actual trackpad movement, you will still require some conductive material to make that connection so that it can be used in that sense. And then we have Sixth Sense. After six months of radio silence, more than half a decade after their successful Kickstarter, the folks behind the Sixth Sense VR controller, a company that I think meant well, but so far has failed to deliver, has broken that radio silence. They indicate that one last issue needs to be addressed before the units start shipping to backers. Now, the unfortunate part of this, the technology, the very issue itself, as well as the fix, are not something that current market virtual reality HMDs even have anything to worry about as technology has veered off in a different direction in that almost half a decade of time that's lapsed. So just my two cents, guys. And on the one hand, look, I admire the fact that they're trying to stick to their original goal. They want to deliver this to backers. I do believe they have that intent and they want to fulfill that. I also happen to think they want to get the hell out of Dodge afterwards, but I admire the fact that they're at least trying to deliver this. But what it does, guys, is it highlights probably the biggest issue with Kickstarters that I have. Forget about the Kickstarters and, and where I say the more technical they are, the more likely they are to fail. Let's assume, you know, this is one of those projects, and I do think it is where all the intention of the, in the world to deliver was there. The problem is, so often with projects like this, there's nobody on the team with experience actually bringing something to market, with actual supply chain experience, vendor negotiations. These are a lot of talents, guys, that companies have positions for. The best entrepreneurs in the world usually know when they need to step out of the picture and other people take over. And I think that is what happens here. A lot of the time, you've got a person or a small team with a great idea, but they don't have the experience for all the execution that comes along with that. And what happens? Dates slip. And they don't just slip a little bit. They slip abysmally badly. <laughs> and you get issues like this where half a decade and the thing still hasn't shipped yet. Now, in technology, half a decade can and often is basically a life sentence. It's something that you can't easily recover from because 
what happens two years into it, technology veers off in a whole different direction. And I think that's part of what happened here. Some of those issues that you're struggling with down the road, they're not even issues anymore as far as the market's concerned, but you'll, you and your team, you're still working on them. And when you're talking about potential timelines of half a decade, like I said, in technology, it is simply too freaking long, period. That's it. So aside Forget, like I said, the whole, the more technical they are, the more likely to fail. This is the bigger issue. Even if they are successful, they're simply past their due date. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Now, for some good news, here is a perfect example of the type of optimizations I talked about a few weeks ago that I said needs to be paired with new hardware technology that's being released. Now, this is a device from Oculus. They're calling it multifocal display technology. It's able to mimic retinal blur and a bunch of other things. We don't have to get into the technical here. I can save some of that for the podcast. The video shows side-by-side -side comparisons of their optimizations and enhancements, and they're pretty telling. They have some demos that really take advantage of that multifocal technology. For example, they're achieving five frames per second. Now that doesn't sound impressive, but when you compare it to the before, which is a minute to render one frame, it's pretty significant. Now, this type of optimization is also a convenient counter to someone saying we have strayed from Moore's law. But my take is it depends on how loosely you're willing to stray from that definition. We all know the initial definition and absolutely, if you take that to be the law period, Okay, we stray from that quite a bit recently, but if you achieve the same in principle through a combination of both hardware and optimizations, at least the spirit of that initial proclamation is met. You're doing the same thing, you're just using multiple forms of technology to achieve it. Then we've got Vario. They have been at work, their research and development department has, creating a hardware type of foveated rendering, which they call bionic display. Now, of course, it isn't foveated rendering in hardware form, but it delivers similar results, and the video they have made available for the first time shows what had previously been hard to articulate. And I've talked about this before, and I had those who disagreed with me, and that's fair, but this was the point, really, I was trying to drive home is the similarity, not saying it is. Now, in fact, if you look at the Road to VR article, they describe the process and themselves acknowledge similarity to foveated rendering, but they do it a hell of, heck of a lot better than I initially did, and let's be real, have since. For example, Ben Lang states, the idea is that the reflected high-resolution image will always be positioned at the very center of the user's gaze, with the help of precision eye tracking, while the lower-resolution traditional display will fill out the peripheral view where your eye can't see nearly as much detail. This is very similar to software foveated rendering, except in this case, it's almost like moving the pixels themselves to where they are needed instead of just rendering in high quality in a specific area. And that last part nails what I failed to say, so it's similar, but yeah, different. All right, let's end things off with one of my favorite pieces of software, uh, Plex Media Server, just because of how flexible it is. Now, my close friends and I, we've got very specific uh, tastes, exity among those very geek-centric content. For the most part, we like the same types of movies, TV shows, and if you pair Plex Media Server with something like unlimited Google Cloud Space, well, you've got the recipe for some fantastic geek viewing. And that's exactly what we've done. And between the small group of us, we have something, in my opinion, way better than Netflix or any of the other streaming services because it's tailored specifically to us. And we've each contributed to it, you know, with our own media. We don't have to get into that too deep. If you get my drift, let's just say the end result is worth it. Well, Plex Media now coming to VR or at least Daydream VR specifically with some really cool features. So it's called Plex VR, but that sounds like it's for general VR. Unfortunately, the first iteration isn't. It's Daydream specific. But what it does is it allows you to view all of your content within kind of that 
big cinema-like experience that you've come to expect when these type of apps work in VR. That's the case here, and all that content can be experienced with your buddies or family a slightly different way. So very, very cool. I love the theater style view. Just a note though, guys, it is for premium members only, but if you've got that premium account, you've got the resources and the drive space, well, it's really, really fun to do it this way. Even if it's just with your own family, you can really tailor the experience and now you can do it in VR. Well, guys, that is it for this episode. Have a fantastic game on Friday, a fantastic weekend, likely no podcast over the weekend. I may do a Sunday episode. If I don't, it'll be there Monday for sure. Guys, have a fantastic one. And as always, cheers.